as always, when I ask for questions, you guys give me far too many great things for me to sink my teeth into. I recorded everything in one big go. Uh, I couldn't fit it all on one response, so I've broken it up. Here's part two of my answers to your questions for July 2021. Okay, so Dick Meal asks a very left field question. If I was born a girl, what would my name have been? It would have been apparently Kara. Don't ask me why. Don't ask me where it came from. I just remember my mum saying that one day. Okay, so John Fry asks the question, do I think the watch community or market is going to move beyond some of the hype brands at the moment and become more balanced, become broader? I've got some good news and some good news um, in answering that question. I think the watch community is already moving past those brands. If you pay attention, read the tea leaves, read between the lines, what you'll hear is a lot of people already getting more confident in establishing their own tastes and looking to independence, smaller brands, offbeat brands within the community. So that is already occurring. That is not occurring yet in the market. The market, 99% of which is made up of people that are not necessarily in the watch community, is moving much slower. They are not moving their money to those new brands. And that's great. That's that's the second bit of good news for us in the community. Because what that means is you can be faster, you can be more agile, you can move to more interesting brands, more interesting stuff, for a little while, safe in the knowledge that they're remaining cheap, they're remaining accessible, and you're not going to get gouged. Bear in mind, sooner or later, the market will also see that and will follow the community. But right now, they're not. BBJ Rhino asks a very similar question. Do you think we're at the beginning of the end for so- watch social media, so- watch social influences? Again, the answer is a little bit yes, a little bit No. I think that for people within the community, you and I, people watching this video, I think we are seeing the beginning of the end of that kind of watch social media influencer. I think there's a certain maturity, a certain confidence growing up within this community, most of whom or many of whom sort of came in over the last, say, four or five years ago, and people are prepared to sort of spread their wings, find their own things, and are not necessarily driven by who they see on social media. Having said that, what I would say is, again, that group of people constitutes somewhere between 1% and 5% of the watch market. I think we will continue to see athletes, racing car drivers, celebrities, um, who else? Hip-hop stars, you know, sporting whatever a brand can pay them to wear to drive that and that will continue to drive the market for some time i just think they're becoming less influential on people in the community okay so paul o'shea asks if i think the premium zin puts on their tegumented cases is worth it okay i'll start with this tegumenting is a real thing it's a custom it's a company name for a process called clusterizing i think i said that right it's essentially not dissimilar to what damasco does with their ice their ice hardening it's essentially freeze something make it really really cold under those circumstances the cell structure the granular structure of um, the steel changes Um, you can inject some more carbon atoms and some other atoms into the structure, giving it some more strength without necessarily um, leading to uh, brittleness uh, problems. It's a system which is often used on surgical instruments. I see it occasionally on aircraft parts. So tegumenting and that thing is real. It has real benefits. It is better than surface coating. It penetrates a fair bit deeper into the metal, penetrates a couple of microns down, which gives you better crash, uh, better uh, scratch resistance, also eliminates some of the egg shelling that you can get with DLC and, and other sorts of coatings. All of that said, so it is real, 
it, it's a process that helps. There's a fair bit involved in it. But is it worth the extra? I think Xenal, you know, normally charge you about 500 bucks extra for a tegumented case. Is it worth it? I don't know. That's your call. Okay, so Tour Beyond asks the question, what's all the things behind me? Um, I'm not sure exactly what everything you can see is. There's a picture here. Um, this thing here is with all my shoes and boots on it, I just realized, it is an old, um, an old pianola that I've gutted um, and now use as a desk. Um, and this is um, the Aero helmet I wore in my last Ironman triathlon, which I keep there to remind me that I did not finish that last triathlon. I got sick just beforehand. I didn't realize. Um, and I keep it there as kind of a memento to remind me to get off my ass, um, keep taking my medication, get on top of my condition, and then get back to what I want to be. Okay, so Stefan asks a long question really about Tudor, the Black Bay, and their other options. I won't necessarily answer each part of that, but I'll give my take on what I think Tudor is. Okay, two things. First off, there are two Tudors. There's Tudor Global and Tudor, Tudor West. Tudor retreated from the West back in the 2000s, but they did not go away globally. They kept selling watches in Asia and the rest, other parts of the world. They have their own range that does very well there and sells quite well. They reintroduced themselves into the West and only the West in around about 2012. My theory is they re-entered the West with a kind of Seiko strategy back when Seiko had Grand Seiko and King Seiko. They re-entered with two different ideas. Within a, within a year or so, they introduced on one hand the Black Bay, on the other, which is very backwards looking. And on the other hand, they introduced the North Flag, the Fast Rider, and the Pelagos, very forward looking. And what they were seeing is which would work. And the answer is pretty obvious. The Black Bay worked. And so what we've seen is the Black Bay go from strength to strength, lots of new watches, lots of new designs. And that new forward-looking model largely die. So the... Um, I'm pretty sure the fast ride is gone. I'm, I know the North Flag's gone. Um, there's one or two others that have probably gone. The Pelagos lives on but doesn't really get any love. I think the Black Bay won. So it will be the model for what Tudor is going forward. Do I think that makes them a one-trick pony? Yes and no, because there's another model of a brand which has done something similar and been amazingly successful. Here's the thing. Go to Rolex and look at what the names of their, their watches actually are. And what you'll see is it's the Oyster Perpetual Explorer, Oyster Perpetual Yachtmaster, Oyster Perpetual Sea Dweller, Oyster Perpetual um, Submariner, and you get the drift. They are all... Oyster Perpetuals, with the one exception of the Cellini. Remove Oyster Perpetual, insert Black Bay, and you can kind of see where Tudor's going. They're just following the Big Brother theme of saying, we have found a market where this is the key, this basic design. Now, I think that they're messing up the marketing of this. I think that they've probably over-egged the Black Bay bit, and not given what comes next um, enough kind of oomph. I think they probably needed, like we've got the Submariner and GMT Master and everything, each one of those needed a, their own catchy name, which I think they failed at. But I think that's a marketing thing that they can work through. I think that the Black Bay will become the Oyster Perpetual of Tuna, and I think everything will be okay. Very quickly, you did ask about the Royal and what I think that is. I think that's a rare example of a watch which was not meant for the West. It was actually, it more fits into the Tudor Global, Tudor East part of the company. It just so happened that we saw it. You'll note, and it got some coverage, but you'll note Tudor barely pushed it. There was not a lot of freebies given out. There was nowhere near the kind of push um, in the West that, say, a Black Bay gets. And I think it's not really a product for us. It's a product of Tudor East, not Tudor West. 
and it's not really part of what we're going to see routinely made pr provided to us. Okay, so Lester Loves Watches asks a question I do not know the answer to. Uh, if I was going on some really grueling maneuvers and had to take a 70s chrono, what would it be? I'm not an expert on 1970s chronos. Part of me would just simply say a Speedmaster because, well, you know, it went to the moon, it does the whole NASA testing thing, but also it's got water resistance like none. Um, uh, maybe a Seiko Pogue because Seikos tend to be tougher and more reliable, but I don't know anything about that watch. Um, maybe something like, you know, uh, something like a Breitling Detora or Sprint. Why? Get an Emmanuel Wind, not automatic, that'll be fairly bulletproof. And those watches back then were tiny. They were like 36, 37 mils. So you could easily wear them like under gloves and things and perhaps protect them from the outside world. That's probably the best answer I can give you. Okay, so Floyd Morrison asks a couple of questions, one of which I've already answered. So what's up with this thing? It was a pianola, came into my possession. I tried to get it repaired, couldn't. Started to strip it down so I could throw it away. Got to this point and realized, actually, it makes a great desk. So one day I'm going to finish kind of restoring it as a desk. But right now, this is pretty much how I use it. Um, secondly, how does my um, how deep does my sweater collection go? Not as deep as you'd think. I've actually only got about five, but I do live in them. It's funny. My I care deeply about my watches. I want my watches to really reflect me. I think an enormous amount about my watches. One of the things you'll notice about the rest of my clothes is it is deliberately generic and unbranded and doesn't really say much at all. I think there's a style of dress, they call it normcore. That's very much me. And that's when it comes to my clothing, that's just what I do. So yeah. Um, I love my cable knits and my very simple unbranded jumpers. That's what I do. Okay, so that's it. The second in a series of three where I'm responding to your questions in July 2021. One more uh, episode of this series to go. That'll be out tomorrow and I'll see you then. Bye.